Hey y'all. So today we're going to be going back into chapter 14, which is super long and very rich because it's a culmination of um, all the concepts that we've learned through the book. At least that's how I'm perceiving it. So the story of the Handless Maiden is bringing together um, all of the process that one goes through um, in awakening, in becoming conscious of um, hard things in reality that we uh, maybe were very naive about, um, that we've had to learn, experience, and, and therefore learn, learn from and process, and then how that changes us, how it actually winds up being to our benefit in the end because it prompts us to go through a transformative stage in our life. And they're actually um, going to talk, she's going to talk about that today um, in the section that we're going to read. So I really enjoyed reading this section um, and now I'm excited to present it to you and to share it with you. And I always love to hear your thoughts um, if you want to, if you feel called to share in the comments, that would be great. So um, the section today is called the fourth stage finding love in the underworld and this section is actually um really long and so the part we're going to cover today is um prepping us for um you know uh getting to that point of finding love in the underworld so uh, i think a lot of this had to be laid out and explained first um and then i, I stopped at the point where i feel like it's a good transition um, where she, um, next time we'll cover where she's talking about, um, the maiden and the king, um, falling in love, essentially. So, um, okay. <clears throat> the fourth stage, finding love in the underworld. Um, I want to open this section by saying that, you know, it's, um, I just want to reiterate <laughs> that, uh, transforming yourself and, um, and going through, life experiences and then after that point processing and allowing yourself that time means that it's not a process that you can hurry through you know what I mean I think sometimes that's the ego part of us that wants to just hurry up and be like I'm good I'm good now I got it I got it all figured out let's 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 go let's move forward or whatever you know with with your life um, and it's just um, at that point you're only making yourself more vulnerable I mean we're doing it to ourselves at that point um, getting overly confident so I just you know I think even if you know you still have a lot of things to figure out um, with the most current things that have transpired transpired in your life um, I think that because you're, you're never going to stop learning, right? We never stop uh, learning or growing until we move on from this world. But, um, you know, I just, I just want to encourage you to um, not give up, um, to continue to work, to be mindful every day um, because that, that is the work. Because the more mindful we are over our own um, thought process, and it means we're basically uh, engaging actively and consciously that gatekeeper part of our psyche, which is what protects us, which is what keeps us from being vulnerable to predators in the world and people who would, um, you know, look to take advantage of us or worse. So um, being mindful, even if that's, you know, the only part that you feel confident in, that's, that's I think, a place we need to um, start every day. Um, from is being mindful and observant um, so and, and then that gives us a safe place to do the work you see what I'm saying um, because we we have to admit that we're you know while we're learning and processing from our experiences and from wisdom that we gain from other people too that we're trying to process um, as we're, we're doing this work we are still vulnerable right and we'll always be vulnerable to an extent but I don't think we'll you know we're just going to decrease that and minimize that greatly over time as we um, as we grow and learn so engaging that gatekeeper part of your psyche um, being mindful being observant I think that's just super important be patient with yourself um, never getting in a hurry and and here's another thought too as we're going through um, you know a transformative journey um, or stage in our life. Um, I feel like these kind of processes that this author discusses um, in depth, 
through the method of storytelling, I think these processes happen anyway, whether we are mindful of them or not. The psyche, the mind is always working. You know what I mean? It's, it's always, um, you know, the wheels are always going. Which I think is why sometimes you can catch yourself having a thought. And, you know, I relate it to, like, um, I feel like sometimes our mind is, uh, like, or our brain is like an antenna, <laughs> a receiver. And we'll just have these random thoughts float by sometimes, like um, radio waves. And it's kind of like, where did that come from? You know, these bizarre thoughts that just pop in. And the difference in people is those who, who grab onto that thought and identify with it and claim it as their own versus someone who is um, keeping guard over their thoughts, which we're instructed to do in the Bible. And those are the people who are going to, you know, um, notice this random thought coming by as a radio wave and say, that's bizarre, and just let it go and be like, I don't agree with that. You know what I mean? So you can reject thoughts. If there's something that pops up and it doesn't align with um, your beliefs or it's, you know, it's a bad or negative thought, um, if we latch onto that, that can take us down the wrong path. Um, toward fear and, and anger and all these um, bad things. So my point is, <laughs> I know I go off on so many tangents, but I feel like it's valuable, you know? I hope you do too. But um, essentially, the mind's always at work. And the more mindful we can be, the more we're going to have control over, um, I wouldn't say the process, but over how the process that's happening within our psyche turns out for us. That's what we can have control over. How the process turns out for us. It's like steering the process is, is our part, you know, um, in deciding to claim or dismiss a negative thought or be mindful of looking at things through um, the lens of the victory that, you know, hey, this is for my benefit ultimately and I know things are gonna work out and so it's that whole faith over fear thing. Um, so I hope that just gives you some encouragement as we head into this, um, this section here. And um, yes, and also don't be discouraged if you decide to, um, I've done this. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm thinking about this. If you, uh, let's say for example, meet up with an old friend and they're like, hey, what's going on with you? And you're thinking, a lot. <laughs> if you decide to open up a little bit and share with someone and, and, you know, and you get this blank stare back or like they just really don't even know what in the world you're talking about, you know, this, this um, soul journey that you're on, you know, um, just don't get discouraged because, um, you know, it's, it's different for everybody. Everybody's experience um, through um, transformative stages in their, their life is, is going to be a one of a kind a uh, kind of journey and so um, what I love about this section is um, what she's ultimately saying when she says finding love in the underworld the fact that <clears throat> this is the, the the bad side versus the good side that we were just talking about like the bad side is your friend or whoever may not understand or be able to relate to you as you're opening up um, but the good part of that is well, that just means that when you do find someone who understands, um, it's, it's going to be a special connection. You see what I'm saying? And so I love how sh her, she's talking about finding love in the underworld versus the topside world. And I feel like you can look back on your life, probably, I know I can, and say, well, I, I totally understand then, you know, why topside world connections are probably not going to last. They're just temporary, um, but they serve a purpose to help us learn and grow, right? So I just hope that gives you some encouragement. All right, here we go. So she opens up the section, the fourth stage, finding love in the under underworld, talking about the story, revisiting the part of the story where the king comes to count his pairs, right? Um, in the garden. And he notices one's missing. So that's where he decides to, um, to, sit out there overnight with his, um, I think he had two advisors, right? I know he had, um, okay, with his gardener. So it's the king with his gardener and his magician who knows how to speak with spirits, right? And that's when they catch the maiden coming by like at midnight with her spirit guide as well. And they get to watch the tree bend its bow down so that she can eat a pear. So, um, <clears throat> he's questioning the magician and, um, the magician is able to speak with the maiden and says, you know, are you of this world? And she says, 
where's it at? She says, I was once of the world, and yet I am not of this world. So when the king asks the magician, you know, is she human or spirit? He says she's both, right? Which a lot of times it's going through hard experiences in life to wake up our spiritual side. Or if we were already a, a spiritual person, um, it just deepens that and just, you know, um, peels off layers of, of uh, revelations for us, you know, and makes the kind of things that we used to read about, you know, become personal at this point. We just gain deeper understanding so that we are indeed both uh, human and material, physical beings as well as spiritual beings. So there's that numinous part of us. So then it says, um, she goes into the symbolism. She says, the king is a wizening creature in the underworld psyche. He is not just any old king, but one of the chief watchers of a woman's unconscious. So again, kind of that gatekeeper role, right? He watches over the botany of the growing soul. His and his mother's orchard is rich with the trees of life and death. He is of the family of the wild gods. Like the maiden, he is able to endure much. And like the maiden, he has another descent ahead of him, but more of that later. In one sense, you could say he is trailing the maiden. The psyche always shadows its own process. This is a most sacred premise. It means that if you are wandering, there is another, at least one, and often more, who is seasoned and experienced, and who waits for you to knock at the door, rap on stone, eat a pear, or just show up in order to announce your arrival in the underworld. This loving presence waits and watches for the wandering seeker. Women are well aware of this. They call it a little flicker of light or insight, a presentment or a presence. So this reminds me of what we referenced in the last video, talking about the, um, the two sets, um, the two pairs of footsteps along the sand, that story, you know, where we feel alone, but all along, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, was with us. And so again, feel free to apply your own lens if you're not, um, if those are not in alignment with your beliefs, right? Um, but hopefully it's still meaningful for you to think about these things. So <clears throat> yes, yes, it does feel, and you know, a lot of psychologists break down um, the processes in our mind through like, um, what's it called? Like family dynamics. There's a term uh, that uses the word family so that we can comprehend how the mind works. It's just another lens to to understand um, the human mind, essentially. <clears throat> and so you throw spirituality in there, numinosity, and you realize, you know, that um, that we're not alone. And so just a, a, a cool way to look at things. So it says, the twist in the tale that makes it modern is that the devil image portrays a figure that in ancient women's initiation rites was normally portrayed by the crone in her dual nature as life bringer and life taker. In this tale, the devil is portrayed as the life taker only. <clears throat> so, um, this is, this, you know, when I was reading through this, this part didn't really seem relevant to start with, but I, it, it will as we go on. So just hang on to that thought. She says, however, back in misty time, it is a good bet that this sort of story originally presented the crone playing the part of the initiator slash trouble causer, making things difficult for the sweet young uh, heroine. So, so, impar so embarkation from the land of the living to the land of the dead could occur. Did you, did you catch that? So, <clears throat> I'm gonna read it again. So, the point here is that, you know, if you're looking at the character, she's saying that in this story, the devil character is replacing what historically throughout different myths would be represented by the crone, the old hag, you know, the old wise woman that people are kind of scared of and unsure of, but really she just, you know, is, she knows it all. <laughs> um, so in this story, the devil's taking that, that um, spot in that character role, but she's basically saying that, <clears throat> Um, the crone typically plays the initiator who makes things difficult for us, right? Um, and in the story for the, um, the maiden, so that she can embark from the land of the living to the land of the dead. So that's the point of um, our hardships, essentially, is what the stories are telling us. That, you know, there's this older, wiser being who, who actually <laughs> is initiating or causing trouble 
so that it'll shake things up for us. You know, if we're just naive and innocent and very vulnerable to a lot of damage, then it's kind of reminds me of when she was talking about the, uh, the mama wolves and how they'll take their little wolf pups and just intentionally just kind of nudge them into, you know, um, you know, the water or a dangerous situation and just toughen them up. She, she referenced this as toughening them up. And so, um, I don't think we think about that this happens in our life too, you know, that, that, um, you know, how often do we think about our loving creator and the fact that he says he uses all things for our good. I don't know that he initiates, you know, the bad things. Um, I guess that would be debatable depending on your beliefs, right? Um, all the different um, belief systems out there. But, but regardless, it is stated, at least in the Christian Bible, that he um, uses all things for our good. So just really interesting, right? And um, you might even say, I think some people... Um, have um, discussed this from the lens of the higher self, um, which would mean doing it to ourselves, <laughs> like some unconscious part of us doing something that isn't good for us because on some level we know that things need to change in our life. <laughs> it's like an unconscious attempt at waking ourselves up. <laughs> so there's so many different ways you can look at this and I just encourage you if you have interest to look at some of these um, <laughs> different belief systems and books and stories um, and just kind of find what's true for you and what resonates with you. So it's just very uh, interesting to me. So she says, psychically, this is cohesive with concepts in the Jungian psychology, theology, and the old night religions that the self, capital S, or in our parlance, the wild woman seeds the psyche with perils and challenges in order that the human in despair drives herself back down into her original nature, looking for answers and strength, thereby reuniting with the great wild self and as much as possible thereafter moving as one. So another thing too is a lot of times we, we um, can come to a point where we can look back in hindsight and see how everything that we have gone through in life has brought us to this point. And um, whether, whether um, it was, you know, instigated, um, you know, this way or from this point or that point or from up there or from in here, you know, the point is that um, it's just so interesting, isn't it, to look back on your life and say, you know, in the moment in, of things, we can be um, just so down sometimes and, and, and frustrated with ourselves for being naive or not understanding or, you know, acting a certain way or not doing something or whatever it is. Uh, but in the end, uh, we can look back and, and, you know, at different points in our life and say, wow, I can't believe this and this and this happened because look, now it's completely useful and valid and important in my life for whatever it is um, going on in our life at that moment. So um, that might just be a good thing to journal on if you have interest because I know um, a lot of us um, have those kind of realizations. So... <clears throat> Then she goes into saying um, <clears throat> that we often find ourselves fighting off the devil in the form of cultural, familial, or intrapsychic injunctions that devalue the soul life of the wild feminine. So there's just another um, little something to think about. So then she says the major agents of transformation present in this orchard at this time are in the approximate order of their appearance, the maiden, spirit and white, gardener, king, magician, and mother slash crone, and the devil. <coughs> Which I thought the devil was early. Early in the story. I don't know why she put that last. Maybe I'm forgetting something. Traditionally, they represent the following intrapsychic forces. So now she's going to break down the symbolism of the characters, which is cool. So she says the maiden represents the heartfelt and formerly sleepy psyche, the naive part of us, right? Uh, but a warrior um, heroine lies beneath her soft interior, exterior. So she's soft on the outside, but a warrior in her heart. You know, I love that. So, it says she is able to bear things, the dirt, the grime, betrayal, hurt, loneliness. Um, and it says that she's able to wander the underworld and return enriched to the topside world. 
So then she goes into the symbolism of the spirit in white that accompanies the maiden in the garden. Um, that is representative of our God. So the God is one who has an innate and gentle knowing, uh, a trailblazer for your journey, okay? So remember, these are supposedly all parts of our own psyche. Okay, so then she goes into talking about the gardener, and I'm simplifying these, okay? So she elaborates a little bit, but just for time purposes. <laughs> Um, the gardener, I'm going to go ahead and read all of this for you. The gardener is a cultivator of soul, a regenerative keeper of seed, soil, and root. He is similar to the Hopi Cocapelli, who is a humpbacked spirit who comes to the villages each spring and fertilizes the crops as well as the women. <laughs> the gardener's function is regeneration. The psyche of a woman must constantly sow, train, and harvest new energy. Okay, so we have to that's where the mindful motivation you know within ourselves needs to happen <clears throat> in order to replace what is old and worn out right um, to make sure we don't get stuck there is a natural entropy or wearing down and using up of psychic parts this is good this is how the psyche is supposed to work but one must have uh, energies and training ready to backfill this is the role of the gardener in the psychic work he keeps track of the need for change and replenishing. Uh, so, yes. And she says, intrapsychically, there is constant living, constant death dealing, constant replacement of ideas, images, energy. So it's that life, death, life cycle, essentially, right? And, and that's the gardener. So then she goes into talking about the king. The king represents a trove of knowledge in the underworld. He carries the ability to take inner knowing out into the world and put it into practice without mincing, muttering, or apologizing. I love that, right? That's, that's a, a description of, um, of someone very strong. Um, so, the king is the son of the mother queen slash crone. Like her and probably following her lead, he is involved in the mechanisms of vital process of the psyche, the failing, dying, and return of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> later in the story, when he wanders looking for his lost queen, he will undergo a kind of death that will transform him from a civilized king to a wild one. I love this. Um, I'm thinking about dreams I've had. <clears throat> it's really interesting. These archetypal uh, symbols and... and stories so so interesting he will find his queen and so be reborn in psychic terms this means that the old central attitudes of the psyche will die as the psyche learns more the old attitudes will be replaced by either new or renewed viewpoints concerning just about everything in a woman's life or, or in anyone's life, right? In this sense, the king represents renewal of the ruling attitudes and laws in a woman's psyche. So I thought that was very appropriate for that character, right? That's um, how we transform, the strength that, that we need to transform um, and how that happens, what that means, how does that look, you know? What's, how would you describe the transformation? All of that, that's, that's coming from a wise and strong and knowing um, and able king you know like a warrior king strong um yes because <clears throat> she says failing dying and return of consciousness that's not for the weak of heart i can tell you that <laughs> so great character for that the mage the major magician whom the king brings with him to interpret what he sees represents the direct magic of a woman's power and i would say men have this ability to i think this is going to wind up being i can't remember i think the intuition so just hang with me. Um, such things as a split second recall, the thousand league vision, the hearing over miles, the empathetic ability to see from behind anyone's eyes, human or animal, all these belong to the instinctual feminine. It is the magician who shares in these and also traditionally helps to maintain them and enact in the outer world. Um, in conscious life, the mage assists a woman's ability to become whatever she wishes to portray herself as at any given moment so that last sentence was strange to me because I feel like it seems a little bit narcissistic honestly um, if you're true if you're just a true person you're not gonna be shape-shifting so every now and then I'll come across something and I'll feel like everything sounds good I'm processing and then I get to a point where I'm like I don't know about that so um, 
maybe maybe you can find meaning in that I did skip a little bit so maybe the context is missing here so I don't know all right so then it's talking about the queen mother slash chrome the queen mother slash chrome in this tale is the king's mother this figure represents many things among them fe fecundity hang on let me see how to say this it's fecundity and so never stop learning right <laughs> and it means the ability to produce new offspring or new growth okay so um that's what the um the queen mother slash crone represents in the story um the vast authority to see into the tricks of the predator as well and the ability to soften curses the word fertility has been has behind it the sense of seed seeds eggs beings and ideas fecundity is the basal matter in which seeds are laid prepared warmed incubated saved this is why the old mother is often called by her oldest names mother dust mother earth ma'am and ma for she is the muck that makes ideas happen i love that <clears throat> all right so then she goes into talking about the devil and it says in this story the dual nature of the woman's soul which both badgers and heals her remember kind of like that that mother wolf with her pups has been replaced by a single figure the devil <clears throat> as we have noted before this devil figure represents the natural predator of a woman's psyche a contra naturum against nature aspect that opposes the development of psyche and attempts to kill off all soul it is a force that is split off from its life-giving aspect it is a force that must be overcome and contained this is interesting because if you're comparing she's trying to compare um in these stories you know some have the character of the crone and some have the devil this one has the devil so <clears throat> in both instances okay if there's a crone at work in our life, um, this is someone who's going to present challenges and hardships um, symbolically. We're talking metaphorically here, right? Um, for our benefit, explicitly for our benefit, like that tough love from, you know, the, the wolf mom, right? Um, but it's still going to be hard for us, but it's for our benefit. And then on this side, you have the devil who's also going to present challenges and hardships, but it's not for our benefit. It's for his benefit. For that bloodline you know what I'm saying of darkness um, <clears throat> for the advancement of darkness in the world and to our detriment so so that's the difference there with the crone is for our benefit for from if it's coming from the devil it's intended for our detriment for our harm um, for someone's benefit but not ours right um, like with narcissism now here's here's the great thing okay so you have the crone and you have the devil but then you have God <laughs> If that's in your belief system, okay, or the higher power, however you want to reference um, this. And the point here is that um, the verse in the Bible is that, you know, yeah, this might happen over here with the devil, but it's still going to get turned into our benefit in the end. So, um, things to think about. So, she says, so here in this underworld orchard awaits the powerful gathering together of those powerful parts of the psyche, both male and female. They form a con conjunctive conjunctio conjunctio this worm is warm. <laughs> i guess i'm thinking about the soil over here <laughs> the fertility and the soil and the gardening and all this right <laughs> let's try again this word is from alchemy and means a higher transformative union of unlike substances when these opposites are rubbed together, they result in the activation of certain intrapsychic processes. They act like flint struck against rock in order to make fire. It is through the conjunction and pressure of dissimilar elements inhabiting the same psychic space that soulful energy, insight, and knowing are made. The presence of the sort of conjunctio, conjunctio we have in this story signals an activation of a verdant life death life cycle so it's activating that cycle right everything to our benefit <clears throat> everything for progress for progressing our our soul um in our in our um in our life through our life when we see this is when we see this rare and precious gathering we know that a spiritual marriage is imminent 
and that a spiritual death will take place and also that a new life will be born. These factors predict what is to come. Conjunctio is not something one goes out and gets. It is something that occurs because hard, hard work is being done. Yeah, that resonates, right? It does for me. <clears throat> All right. So, um, she's going into talking about pairs, the symbolism of the pairs here. She says, um, pairs archetypally represent a burst of new life, a seed of new selfhood. In much of myth and fairy tale, the fruit trees are under the dominion of the great mother, the old wild mother, and the king and his men are her stewards. The pears in the orchard are numbered, for in this transformative process, all things are attended to. It is not a haphazard design. All is recorded and tallied. Um, because some part of us, again, even on a subconscious or unconscious level, is always paying attention right um and always the the puzzle pieces we're, we're absorbing we're absorbing we're absorbing and they're 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 kind of moving around back here you know in our sub or unconscious and it's it's up to us to become mindful of this process so that we can steer and guide um everything and, and play that role of the co-creator in our life to manifest a beautiful outcome a beautiful destiny that's just my my two cents there <laughs> She says, the pear bending to feed the maiden is like a bell peeling through, throughout the, out, the underworld orchard, calling forth the sources and forces, the king, the mage, the gardener, and presently the old mother that rush forward to greet, sustain, and assist the, no, I would say novice, but it's novitiate. No, no yeah, I don't know. Holy figures, holy figures throughout the ages assure and reassure us that on the transformative open road, there is already a place set for us. I thought that was cool. And into this place, by scent, by intuition, we are dragged or spirited by destiny. We all arrive in the king's orchard eventually. Um, it is only right and proper. So I'm just seeing like, um, you know, the, the painting of Jesus, you know, it, um, I can't even think of this painting. It's super famous. <laughs> it's where they're all having the feast where uh, it's like right before he's betrayed. You know, I think that he knows. I think that might be where he called out Judas. Um, I can't even think of what it's called. I'll drop it down here. Hopefully you know what I'm saying. Um, the place set for us, right? And we all get there eventually, she says. So, um... She says, in this episode, the three masculine attributes of a woman's psyche, the gardener, king, and magician, are the watchers, questioners, and helpers in a woman's underworld journey, where nothing is as it first seems. So I thought that was really interesting. And, and so they watch as the spirit again drains the moat. As we mentioned before, this moat represents a symbol similar to that of the sticks. The, the river, remember, which was a poisonous river on which the souls of the dead were ferried from the land of the living to the land of the dead. It was not poisonous to the dead, but only to the living. Beware then the sensation of repose and accomplishment that can seduce humans into feeling that a spiritual deed or completion of a spiritual cycle is a point where one may stop and rest on her laurels forever. Yes, we have to keep moving. The moat is a resting place for the dead, a completion at the end of life, but the living woman cannot stay too long near it, else she becomes lethargic in the cycles of soul making. Through the round river symbol, the moat, the moat, the tale warns us that this water is not just any water, but a certain kind. It is a boundary, much like the circle the maiden drew around herself to keep the devil away. When one crosses into or through a circle, one is in entering into or passing through to another state of being, another state of awareness or lack of it. Here, the maiden is passing through the state of unconsciousness reserved for the dead. So this is maybe like where we're accessing what's going on here. And we're processing at a really deep level. We're, we're actually diving down deep to get that understanding and then bringing that back up to the topside world with us. You know what I'm saying? So we're changed. We have a literally new set of eyes at this point. She is not to drink of this water or wade through it, but rather pass through its dry bed because a woman must pass through the land of the dead in a descent. Sometimes she becomes confused and thinks she must die. 
but this is not so. The task is to pass through, through the land of the dead as a living creature, for that is how consciousness is made. Yes, yes. It's having that strength, which is symbolized by the king, you know, um, who eventually joins the maiden on the quest. Um, you know, we, we have to build up that strength to be able to take a hard and close look at difficult things that really need to be processed on some level. Um, and, and we need to be patient with ourselves um, while, while the process is, is going so that we can get to that point of, of deep understanding. Because, you know, we are instructed, uh, the principal thing is wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. And I, that just resonates with me for this section here. It's kind of like that's what's happening when, when you dive down and you, you, you know, just kind of pass through the river. Like a, an awakening, you know, <clears throat> or at least an aha moment. <laughs> um, so she says, so this moat is a very important symbol. And y'all excuse me, it's kind of hard to talk today. <clears throat> I'm having a lot of um, um, post-nasal drainage and it's just sitting on my vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually hard to to pronounce words. It's just sitting back there, and um, I'm trying to drink my water. I still have my coffee. I'm, I have my usual combo today: <laughs> my coffee, and then I have my my large water here beside it. But y'all, just please be patient with me. I hope you can understand me, okay? All right. So she says. So this moat is a very important symbol, and the fact that the spirit in the tail drains it helps us to understand what we must do on our own journey. We must not lie down and go to happy sleep. <laughs> so we have to keep moving. We have to apply what we learn along the way. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> we can't go to sleep over what has been thus far attained in our work. Neither should we jump into the river in a crazy attempt to hasten the process. There is death with a lowercase d, and there is death with a capital D. The one the psyche seeks in this process of life, death, life cycles is la muerte por un instante, death for now, right? Just an instant. Not la muerte eterna, death for a long time. Not the permanent kind. <laughs> An ego death, right? A transformation. So then she goes um, into talking about the magician, um, asking the maiden if she's of this world. And she says, I was once of the world, and yet I am not of this world. So it says the, it says the maiden's cryptic reply, <coughs> excuse me, acknowledges that she belongs to the land of the living, and yet is stepping to the life-death-life cadence, and that because of that, she is a human being in descent as well as a shade of her former self. She may live in the topside world days. Days. She may live in the topside world days, but the work of transformation occurs in the underworld, and she is able to be in both, like La Quesabe, she who knows. All this in order to learn her way, in order to clear her way to the true and wild self. Yes. So, um, then she goes into talking about <clears throat> specifics, you know, like um, advising uh, her clients to ask questions, you know, all kind of questions, phrasing your questions just a certain way, um, answering them from your individual viewpoint, from, you know, um, collectively, what you think, you know, in general, um, people would, would um, say how they would answer things, just, you know, looking at things through different lenses and different perspectives and just examining, I feel like. So questions are great to, to really help keep the wheels turning for us. And her point here is that we're trying to define what it means to descend, right? We're trying to be mindful and, and aware. So she says, when, <clears throat> when women or men are in this state of dual citizenship, they sometimes make the mistake of thinking that to go away from the world, to leave the mundane life with its chores, its duties, that not only beckon but irritate beyond reason, that this is a sterling idea. Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disagree with that. A vacation sounds pretty nice right now. <laughs> But this is not the best way, she says, for the outer world at these times is the only rope left around the ankle of the woman who is hanging, wandering, working upside down in the underworld. <coughs> Excuse me. 
It is an excruciatingly important time when the mundane must play its proper role in exerting an otherworldly tension and balance that helps lead to a good end. That's where that may mean the simplicity and things, you know, like washing dishes, you know, mindfully. I think there's even like a, a book with something like that in the title. I'll have to see if I can find it. <laughs> Where, you know, you can make just everyday things like a meditative practice, you know? <laughs> All right. And so we wander on our way asking ourselves, if truth be known, muttering to ourselves or really, am I of this world or the other? And answering, I am of both. And we remind ourselves of this as we go along. A woman in such a process must be of both worlds. It is the wandering in such a manner that helps to wring out every last bit of resistance. <clears throat> every last possibility of hubris to flatten out every last objection we might think of. For wandering this way is tiring, so it's that inner resistance, right? That ego, I think, is the way I see it, like hanging on by a thread. <laughs> and then you have those that are encouraging this too, you know? <clears throat> but the special kind of fatigue <clears throat> causes us to finally surrender ego fears and ambitions and just follow what comes. I thought that was cool. So it's like, you know, getting to a point where we we have refined our discernment and, you know, we understand that a leap of faith within the right things um, is a good thing, right? <clears throat> so, as a result, our understanding of our time in the underground forests will be deep and complete. So, she starts to talk about um, the second pair uh, that, you know, where the bow bends down to feed the maiden. <clears throat> and, um, she says, in fact, the young maiden, in fact, tastes the fruit of the secrets of life and death. Um, and how the fruit is a primal image of cycles of flowering and growing and ripening and receding. So it's like whole cycle, right? She says, <coughs> um, you know, how do we find this pair? She says, we immerse ourselves basically in the mysteries of all this. Um, which is how we process and we learn. And uh, she talks about feeding our deep creative hunger, whether it's to write or paint or sculpt or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> so many ways to get there. You know, even washing the dishes. <laughs> so, she says, this is the true nature of the psychic tree. It grows, it gives, it is used up. It leaves its seed for new. It loves us. Such is the life, death, life mystery. It is a pattern. <clears throat> Yeah, and then she says the pattern is, is this. In all dying, there is uselessness that becomes useful as we pick our way through it all. What knowing we will come to reveals itself as we go along. In all living kind, loss brings a full gain. Our work is to interpret this life-death life cycle to live it as gracefully as we know how to howl like a mad dog when we cannot. So, yeah, we need to feel free to fully feel our feelings, you know, um, in private, somewhere safe um, and appropriate. <laughs> um, and she says, and to go on. For ahead lies the loving underworld family of the psyche that will embrace and assist us. Um, yes, I, I love... Uh, <clears throat> I love this paragraph here, which is why I want to close here, just before she starts talking about uh, the union of the king and the maiden, um, because <clears throat> this last paragraph, you know, she's talking about, um, you know, the dying, the pattern, she says, in all dying, there is uselessness that becomes useful as we pick our way through it all, um, because it is a trans transformation process. Um, the old must pass away, and... Um, <clears throat> You know, that's, um, sometimes that even means connections, and that's difficult. And not, not I'm not even talking about, like, narcissistic, um, connections. Um, although, if you, if you have had or been through, like, one main narcissistic relationship, that, that probably opened your eyes to narcissism in general, and you've probably started seeing those, uh, traits at least, or qualities and other connections you have, but, um, <clears throat> So there's that, and those connections can fall apart. But also, um, just as you grow, you know, you change. And so um, I love how 
she then goes into talking about the king and the maiden, which we'll talk about next time. It's like, you know, they're going, they're each going through their own uh, transformation process, but they're, they're doing it together, right? <clears throat> Even though in the story they're apart for for some time, but um, but ultimately they're, you know that going through everything that they go through is what you know uh, brings them to their uh, beautiful union in the end of the story. So you know it's <clears throat> I think that you know as we grow and change, um, it's going to be reflected in our life in a, in a variety of ways, and so it's just. Um, to our benefit, I feel like if we can be as aware and mindful and conscious of this process um, as, as possible, um, intentionally, with intention, you know, as opposed to just kind of floating along and, you know, being um, spontaneous and not ever just stopping to be curious about things and to, you know, and to seek wisdom and to try and, and better ourselves, you know, and I think that when we're, we're when we're on that kind of path, we want those same kind of people on that path too. You know, others who also want to grow. So, I hope this has been encouraging for you. Um, I look forward to meeting back here again and finishing up um, this section here, stage four, talking about the king and the maiden. And then after um, we're through with this section, there's actually not a lot left, but I'm not sure. I can't say how long the video will be, obviously. <clears throat> Because um, we may we may um, pull ideas from this section and then just discuss additional ideas as as well. So the next stage is called the fifth stage, the harrowing of the soul. So that'll be interesting to you, I hope. So thank you again, and I just appreciate you guys so much. The likes, the shares, the comments, um, just all of it coming along this journey with me. And I hope that you have a beautiful day, and I will see you again very soon. Love.